I got my first cell phone, this one, back in 1996. I missed out on the Zach Morris era, but even 20 years ago, these things were pretty rudimentary. This phone could make and receive calls, and that's about it. That's right, no text messages, no emails, and certainly no Twitter. Back then, coverage maps looked nothing like they do today. Now the majority of the country is covered in swaths of red, pink, blue, and yellow. 20 years ago, major metro areas had decent service, and that's about it. Dead zones were way more common, and voice quality could get really spotty on those analog carriers. But on the plus side, at least you were allowed to talk on the phone while you were driving. Choosing a phone provider meant compromising on where you wanted coverage. One of them might be good at home, but would leave you with no service at work. Sure, there was roaming where you could go onto another provider's network or outside your own home area, but forget about it. Roaming charges back then were insane. It got worse when digital services started appearing and industry schismed into CDMA and TDMA. Roaming between those technologies was impossible, at least for digital calls and services. So, for 20 years, I've wanted a phone that could not only support all wireless protocols and bands, but that could hop from one provider's network to another and find the best signal, and nowadays, fastest data. That's why I signed up for Project Phi. It's the realization of a 20-year-old wish and the logical next step in mobile service. Google's new service sounds revolutionary. I mean, it's a completely new technology, right? Well, no. It's actually just a hodgepodge of existing technologies and products brought together in a real useful way. First, there's the cellular service itself. I know that I said I've been waiting 20 years for a phone that can switch to the best provider available in a given area, but companies like Shaka Mobile, Close Call America, and Jitterbug Wireless have, over the last few years, been offering service that could hop between wireless networks which use the same protocols and frequencies, specifically Verizon and Sprint, but I never paid those guys much mind. I mean, who wants a cell provider named after a 1920s dance? Besides, mobile service in the US is such a hodgepodge that even network operators like Verizon and Sprint, which utilize compatible technology, sometimes lease carrying capacity from each other or a third party, which is basically just roaming without the crazy charges. Google chose T-Mobile and Sprint because they use diverse frequencies and protocols, and while they might be located on the same physical tower, it's far less likely that they would use the same equipment or backhauls. In this case, the divergence of cellular providers in the US is a good thing. It led to redundancy. And while Google is the first company to offer such diverse network options under one roof with one number, multi-provider data equipment has existed for years. The only trouble was that you have to sign one contract with T-Mobile and another with Sprint, for example. That's exactly what Google has done for you with Project Phi. They've signed their own contract with those guys. But T-Mobile and Sprint aren't providing you, the end user, with traditional cell phone service. They're acting as data carriers only. They don't handle your calls or your text messages. They just give your phone an IP address and a route to the internet. And indeed, with Project Phi, all calls and text messages arrive at your phone via an internet connection, whether that be through T-Mobile, Sprint, or a local Wi-Fi access point. And again, this isn't revolutionary. If you've ever used Google Voice, you've already used Project Phi. Phi's phone, SMS, and voicemail services are all based in Google Voice. And that's not much of a secret. In fact, I'm able to sign into Google Voice on my old HTC One. I can place calls and send texts using my Project Phi phone number. In Voice, my Phi number is referred to as Nova Integration, Nova being a well-known codename for Project Phi. And this arrangement is further evidenced by the settings in Google Hangouts on my Phi Nexus 6. There are separate settings for uh, SMS and Phi SMS, because of course the Nexus 6 is still on a hardware level capable of sending and receiving true SMS messages over cellular networks. It's just that most of the messaging functionality has been co-opted by Project Phi, or more exactly, Google Voice. By the way, I am curious to know how 911 calls are routed. Project Phi made me verify my address for the purposes of E911 dispatching. That seems to indicate that emergency calls will go out over Google Voice slash Project Phi. But what if, for example, I'm on a cellular connection that has no data service? Would an emergency call go out over Sprint or T-Mobile's cell phone network? Obviously, I'm not going to call 911 to find out, but I did try calling 311 and 811. In both cases, the dialer just closed without comment after hit send. I hope and assume that 911 would work, though. There's been much ado about Google's pricing for Phi. I give them a lot of credit for not requiring contract. 
The contracts are another thing about the cellular industry that's been irking me for roughly 20 years. But it's hardly a new model. Most other providers already offer some kind of contract-free billing option. Project Fi's pay for what you use policy is also great. While other providers offer rollover data, Google's approach is much cleaner. Project Fi is also less expensive than most comparable service plans, but not by much. The literal and figurative pocket ripper here is the phone itself. I went with the 64 gig version. 32 gigs would have been enough for me, though just barely, but I figured the extra storage space would increase resale value a year or two from now when I get rid of it, which I probably will. But it was $700. Or at least it was $700 until Google dropped the price down to $550 just a couple of weeks after I bought it. That would have been a terrible thing for me, except that they proactively credited $150 onto my account. So I still paid full price for the phone, but my Fi service is effectively free for the next five months. Even $550 sounds like a lot to pay for a phone, but you have to take into account that most subsidized uh, low price or free phones actually have their costs built into your monthly service fee over the life of a contract. Lately, the major providers like Verizon with their confusingly named Edge product have embraced this by offering cheaper plans combined with a separate monthly payment for the phone itself. In essence, that's what Google has done. I know that you can bring your own Nexus 6 to 5, but I didn't have one. And Google offered me financing terms for the phone at zero interest over the course of 24 months. So I'm out of pocket just under 30 bucks per month for the phone itself, which I'm completely okay with. But that has to be factored into the cost of the service. Even if you brought your own Nexus 6 to the party, you must have paid for it somehow. And since you can't go with a cheaper option on Fi, the premium cost of the phone is a requirement that other providers don't have. As for the service itself, the pricing is simple and very reasonable. $20 per month for what they call the basics, which according to them is voice, SMS, and 24-7 support. A, shall we say, data plan is required as well and can be purchased in gigabyte increments from 1 to 10. I'm not sure I understand the point of selecting a monthly amount of data though. See, each additional gigabyte included in the plan costs an additional $10. If I were to use less than my allotment in a given month, Google would issue me a pro rata refund on the following month's bill for the unused data. If I go over my allotment, they'll just bill me a pro rata amount for the data used at the same rate as a data plan, in other words, $10 per gig. So either way, I'm paying about one cent per megabyte of data used. The only difference is that on the one hand I'm prepaying for it, and on the other hand I'm paying after I use it. From my own fiscal standpoint, it's better to pay after. And why do they go to all the fuss of collecting money and then refunding it? Why not just charge a flat rate per meg in the first place? In reality, Google calculates data to the ceiling of 100 megabyte blocks, which cost a dollar each. But conceptually, my point is the same. Why don't they just advertise their rate as one dollar per hundred meg and charge for actual usage? I went with a $10 option, not because I'm standing on principle, but because I spend most of my time on Wi-Fi and only use about 200 megs of my Verizon plan last month. Google has made a big deal about Project Fi using public, unsecured Wi-Fi access points that they deem to be fast and reliable. In fact, that's key to their whole Fi branding. Unfortunately, I've rarely met a public access point that's both fast and reliable. So it's good that, although they make it a huge selling feature, it's also an opt-in feature. When setting up the phone, I was asked if I wanted to participate, and I gave it a big nope. Like I said, I don't use much cellular data anyway, so why do I care? Public Wi-Fi would save me a dollar a month at best. Your mileage may vary, of course. If you're a heavy data user, then you're probably already accustomed to public Wi-Fi, and this is going to be pretty convenient. If that's the case, then a big advantage to you is that Google encrypts all of your phone's data traffic, which is something that can otherwise be snooped by an unscrupulous access point owner. But is that really a good thing? Because guess who's at the other end of the encrypted connection? That's right, the big daddy of all big data, Google. And all your traffic, and I mean all of it, will pass through their servers right for the harvest. And call me paranoid, but I prefer to choose my own access points and, at home and work at least, carry my own data. Fortunately, you can also opt out of Google's VPN encryption service. I've been using Fi for about a month now, and in that time I've had plenty of chances to run speed tests in and around my home and office. It hasn't been geographically diverse testing, but overall I'm satisfied with Sprint and T-Mobile. 
I've seen this phone switch back and forth between the two, and so far they've both had decent speeds, usually between 10 and 20 megabits down, and anywhere from a fraction of a meg to 18 megs upstream. Obviously you might see completely different results where you live or travel, but between the two networks, chances are that you'll have a data connection, and a decent one at that. Now, about the phone itself. There are tons of great Nexus 6 reviews out there, so I'm not going to get too in-depth about the hardware, but I would like to explain my complex love-hate relationship with this phone. First off, the screen is fantastic. Pixel density is ridiculously high. This screen is about 6 inches, and meanwhile my primary workstation monitor is 27 inches, and both have the same number of pixels. That's absolutely crazy. When I went from an OLED screen on my old Galaxy Nexus, to the IPS panel on my HTC One, I actually thought this thing was wrong with the HTC screen. The colors look so washed out and the contrast was terrible. I can't wait for massive amounts of cheap OLED monitors and TVs to hit the market. This is by far the best display technology available today. The CPU and GPU are great. This thing absolutely flies, even when driving all those pixels and running a whole bunch of crap in the background. And battery life hasn't been half bad either. Lollipop has great UI enhancements and Coincidentally, my Verizon HTC got the OTA upgrade two days before my Nexus 6 arrived. However, I love the vanilla Android of my old Galaxy, and I'm happy to be back on a Nexus phone. Though I was able to turn off or remove a lot of my HTC's bloatware, in two years I've never found any benefit from their UI and functional enhancements. However, what I hate most about the Nexus 6 is its size. I hate the word phablet. I hate that native to Android you can't scale the display. Why did I bother upgrading to a 1920 by 1080 screen on my HTC when it showed the icon and text in the same physical size as my uh, 720p Nexus? Why do I now have a 2560 by 1440 screen which has just slightly more effective space due to absurd icon scaling? Why can't Google, Google give me the same 6 inch layout in a 4 inch screen? I don't understand phablets for that reason. Since my first phone, every subsequent phone has been smaller than the one before or at least offered a significant functional leap forward to go along with the increased size. But am I completely wrong about that? Web browsing is one place where the larger screen completely shines through. Fonts and images scale more appropriately, and the extra real estate has made going back to my HTC seem so much more cramped and old-fashioned by comparison. But one thing is for certain. The Nexus 6 fits nicely in some jeans, but not others. And I really don't want to have to take phone size into account when buying pants. Also, I have relatively large hands, yet I can barely reach the left side of the keyboard with my right thumb, and when I do, my grasp on the phone is so precarious that it makes me want to go out and buy a protective case for the eventual day when I drop it. Of course, a case will make the phone even bigger and exacerbate the original problem. If anyone from Google is watching this, why not make your soft keyboard 75% the size and locate it in the lower corner of the screen next to my thumb? Despite my annoyances with the form factor, I'm starting to really like this phone. And for me, the inconvenience of the size is worth being at the cutting edge of the state of the mobile industry. Oh, and would it have killed them to put a freaking micro SD card slot in this thing? The phone is so gigantic, they might as well have threw in a few card slots instead of charging me a ridiculous $50 for an extra 32 gigs of storage. In the end, had Google offered me another smaller phone as an option, I would have bought that. I can't blame them for not giving me a choice though. Project Fi is, in essence, a public beta for their services, and it's in their interest not to support more than one handset in these early stages. I'm not even sure if there is another handset in existence that could support all the, all the various wireless bands and protocols used by Sprint and T-Mobile. Well, this old Blackberry could, but that's another story. Since this is a Nexus device, it didn't come with any carrier or manufacturer added nonsense. Even without Fi, I would have bought a Nexus phone anyway, because Verizon's stuffing of my old HTC with useless uninstallable apps was the last straw for carrier branded phones. They actually put an NFL app on here that one day decided to give me a random and very loud notification about the New England Patriots for no obvious reason in the middle of a meeting. That app and a whole host of others can't be uninstalled without rooting, though they can be disabled. The only extraneous thing preloaded on this was the Project Fi app, which is of course desirable, and it can be uninstalled. The Fi app doesn't do much. It provides the same functionality that you get when logged into your Fi account in a browser. 
It shows data usage, lets you view and make changes to your plan as well as bill billing information, gives you data usage alerts, access to past bills, and a couple of ways to contact support. So far, I've only dealt with their support team once by email, but it was a good experience. They got back to me in less than an hour and actually answered my question directly and thoroughly. Google also knows how to treat their early adopters. A couple of days ago, I received this mysterious FedEx package with a Google Inc. return address. I know everyone likes unboxing, so let's do this real quick. They sent over a pair of earbuds, a battery pack, and a case. While I really do appreciate the gesture, I'm going to be a little bit of a jerk about this nice gift, so bear with me. I'm not a fan of earbuds. These are pretty nice as earbuds go, but unfortunately they won't get much use. I'm also not a fan conceptually of these little USB battery packs. They boggle my mind actually. Why carry around a brick that's larger than your phone when you could just carry around a second battery? Oh, that's right, because the phone's battery isn't removable. And seeing as it's not removable, the phone is already pretty huge. I wouldn't be turned off if it was a couple millimeters thicker and just had a larger battery pack in the first place. That doesn't just go for the Nexus 6. That's my opinion on almost every phone out there. And finally, yeah, I have a problem with phone cases as well. Manufacturers put a whole bunch of effort into design and that's even a mainstay of Apple. Yet the first thing everyone does when they get a phone is to wrap it up in a generic or gaudy case. Moreover, tons of money is spent miniaturizing these things and then everyone goes and makes them bigger with the cases. My point isn't that phones shouldn't be well protected, but just as with the battery thing, I'd rather have a phone that's a few millimeters bigger and is just rugged in the first place. Plus, I just don't think this case is very attractive. Look, I'm not a dick in real life. If my friend gave me these things for my birthday or something, I'd thank them and probably make sure to use this stuff in front of the guy a few times. I certainly wouldn't disparage them on YouTube. But don't forget why Google went to the expense of sending me this stuff. It's marketing plain and simple. They hope that I'll do an unboxing video and talk up their brand to all my friends. Well, they got one of the two at least. So is Project Fi the future of the mobile industry? Will one day carriers be divorced completely from service providers? Would it make financial sense for companies like Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile to eschew their consumer businesses entirely and simply become data infrastructure providers for the likes of Google, Apple, Amazon, and whatever other players might join the field? Most likely, yes. Have you heard of Crown Castle International or American Tower? Probably not, but between them, they own over 80,000 cellular towers in the United States. They lease space on their towers to providers like Sprint and T-Mobile, and they make a ton of money doing so. Sprint and T-Mobile in turn lease out time in their networks to virtual operators like TrackPhone, H2O, or the ridiculously named Jitterbug. Though I don't know the details of their agreement, I'm assuming that Sprint and T-Mobile treat Google as yet another virtual network operator. It appears to be that wholesaling cellular service can indeed be profitable. Think about all the overhead incurred by the big guys in dealing with pesky customers. Call centers, service centers, curating bloatware, marketing. Now, it might sound like I'm somewhat down on Project Fi. No, it's not revolutionary in concept or technologies, but it is the best incarnation and combination of those concepts and technologies that I've seen to date. Google has absolutely hit the nail on the head with this next logical step in the progression of the mobile services industry. Cellular network operators like Sprint will provide internet access and little else. Independent Wi-Fi access points will fill in the gaps and provide a cheaper backhaul. Service providers like Google will provide voice over IP and messaging, as well as handling all of the billing, technical support, and irrationalities of the ugly bags of mostly water on the other end of the line. But this is only one step in the evolution of mobile. In 20 years, I'm sure we'll look on this with as much nostalgia and derision as we now regard this. Thanks for watching. For more about my experience with Project Fi, check out my blog at s.co.tt slash Project Fi.